in this live stream, we're going to go over. This is kind of like a three-part series that I've been doing, talking about like what you should do before you go on vacation, what you should do during your vacation, and then what you can do when you get back when it comes to diet and working out, just so you don't get too thrown off course from a vacation. I was in the Hamptons uh, a few weeks ago, had a beach trip, I took a diet break, took to ate a bunch of all my favorite junk type food. I wouldn't know about junk food, all my favorite like trigger type foods, had a wonderful time. And I'm gonna map the whole thing out. And then we're gonna put this, <laughs> we're gonna put this subject to rest. Hey Michael, thanks for tuning in. Great to see you. Plus we're gonna do, we're gonna do a, great to see you Michael. Plus we're gonna do a, a Q&A throughout the whole live stream and I'll hang around as long as everyone wants to and answer any of your questions on fitness, health, weight loss, or no working out, whatever whatever you want to talk about. Okay, and then I also want to talk about, I'm going to talk about this towards the end. I have, once again, I have a whole bunch of slides to go to. I'm also doing something very interesting this week. I'm actually experimenting with the carnivore diet. I'm going to try it for a week or two, but I'll talk about that at the end of the video. Okay, let's talk about first uh, this three week uh, plan. Okay, like what I did, pre-vacation like my goals before I go on vacation I knew I was gonna be you know and I'm gonna show you a lot of the foods that I've been eating I know I knew I was gonna be overeating right I, I wanted to come out of a calorie deficit for sure okay hey hey Sharon how you doing oh that's great thanks I definitely wanted to come out of a calorie deficit I want to eat some of my favorite foods so the week before I wanted to like lose two or three pounds I wanted to really tighten up my diet. And this is the program that I pretty much followed. Like the week before I went on vacation, I did like a time-restricted eating protocol. Meaning that I didn't change my fasting strategy. I did the same exact fasting strategy every single day for six days. So I fasted for 20 hours, and then I took in all my calories only within a four-hour eating window. And I kind of ate like a half of a meal and then one large meal, and I always prioritize protein. So I was definitely in a calorie deficit, pretty aggressive calorie deficit, and I made sure I had enough protein because I didn't want to lose any muscle mass, right? And then, and then when I, how that week turned out, it worked out pretty good. I had one like little mess up that I talked about in a different live stream. A, a friend of mine from high school who I haven't seen in like 10 years was driving by my house. He texted me, he said, Mike, can you meet me out for a drink? So one night I had one little mess up that week, had a couple glasses of wine, and I had a little bit of an Italian meal, chicken scaparella, which is not that bad of a meal. It's pretty much just chicken breast with hot peppers. And maybe the sauce wasn't the best, but I may have lost more than three pounds if I didn't do that one night. But I really was pretty much like in a probably a mild state of ketosis, and I was three pounds lighter, ready to go on my trip when it came to the diet. Now, when it came to working out that particular week, my pre-vacation, I also wanted to increase the intensity of my workouts a little bit. So as a, like in the past, typically I always would do my cardio, you know, my aerobic, my high intensity training, and my like long walks in a fasted state. And I typically would always take in maybe a protein shake before my resistance training. But for this particular week, I want to do all my training in a fasted state. And I did, I did another live stream going into this plan, like on much more detail. So definitely check that out. In this one, I want to go into what I did more when I got back from vacation and this carnivore diet that I'm doing now. Okay, so that's kind of how I prepped myself for the trip. I entered the trip about three pounds lighter, felt pumped up, felt really good, because I pushed myself pretty hard in the gym. Okay? Now this is what I did when I was on vacation. I kind of didn't stick to exactly what I wanted to. See, initially, I didn't want to do any type of fasting when I was on vacation. I wanted to take a diet break. You know, yo, I always talk about this in all my videos. How like, you know, you know, whenever you're restricting calories for extended periods of time, your metabolism is going to slow down to some degree and you can overdo it. And so, it, you know, if you're constantly in a calorie restricted state. So the whole week before I was restricting calories, lost a few pounds. This was my week to up my calories. And I really didn't want to fast, but I have to say, I typically get not hungry in the morning. Plus, I was so used to doing those 20 hour fast that I wound up sticking with a 16-8 fasting protocol for that whole week. So I fasted for 16 hours every day, and then I pretty much ate whatever I wanted within the eight hour eating window. I'm gonna show you some of the pictures of all the food I was eating, incredible food, I actually loved it. But I did also do a fasted walk for 90 minutes. Like besides taking a break, you know, from being from eating perfectly when I go on vacation, I really wanna enjoy myself and eat whatever I want. I also wanna take a break from working out. And this is something I've talked about before. This is something that I could never do when I was younger. When I was younger, hey Gene, let's see what Gene's got to say. Hey Gene, I only have thir I only have 30 minutes a day for exercise. Should the time be spent 
on resistance training or cardio training or both. You know, I would break it up, Gene. You know, definitely. I would do like when you do resistance training, one day do cardio training the next and mix it up. If you can get in three days of resistance training, I like to hit each body part twice a week. So if you can do like one full body, say Monday, split routine Wednesday, Friday, half your body on Wednesday, the rest on, on Friday, that's your resistance training. And then you do your cardio on your other days, I think you'll be doing great. I think that's a great way to do it. Okay. So not only do I like to take a break on vacation from you know, my diet, I also want to take a break from working out. I want to let my joints rest. In the past, I couldn't do it. I talked about this before. I used to drive my wife crazy. Whenever I had to go on vacation, there had to be a gym nearby. There had to be a gym in a hotel. <laughs> you know, it was like ridiculous. I even talked about when I was in Italy, I found the gold gym. And gym was kind of crazy. So now I really do enjoy taking a break from my normal diet and a break from working out. But I did do the 16-8, right? I ate whatever I wanted and I walked faster for 90 minutes every day just for my brain. You know, it puts me in a good mood to walk for 90 minutes every day. Let me show you some of the foods that I was eating. I really was uh, enjoying myself. I love, um, there's a couple of Italian restaurants. We actually were in Sag Harbor at the beach and there's a place called, um, uh, what's the name of that place? El, I think El Cantina where they have these incredible garlic knots. I mean, I was eating these garlic knots. This is like like hot bread coming out soaked in, in butter and olive oil with tons of garlic, incredible. Baked clams, we went to um, Boswick's, which is my favorite seafood food place. Yeah, that looks great. I love Italian food too, Mike. I love Italian food. Italian food is my trigger foods. These are the foods that I love and I just have them on occasion. I'm Italian, you know, so I love Italian food. Obviously, my wife is actually a great cook. Her family are incredible cooks. You know, but I, you know, you can't eat like this every day. You know, you just, you just can't in my opinion. You know, you can't eat those you know, the pastas and the breads and, you know, on a regular basis. But you can save it on a cheat day. You can save it for like a, like a vacation like this. So this is baked clams. I just love ba baked clams. And this is, people might say, Mike, that looks pretty healthy. But when you look at the side of it, this is probably two pounds of local flounder doused in butter. Like when I make flounder at home, we'll have maybe a pound the most and I'll put it in extra virgin olive oil. And if you can't even see it, but there are, there are these little, like little white potatoes underneath all this fish tons of vegetables, there were some tomatoes. I love, this is my favorite restaurant. So this is the kind of stuff that I was eating. Plus, I was eating a big sandwich on the beach every single day with like turkey, hot super sa, I love hot super sa, you know, things like that. And I was drinking a considerable amount of beer. I like drinking beer, but I don't drink beer. Very rarely you'll see me drink a beer at home, maybe occasionally on the weekend if my brother's coming over or something. If I, if I have to go to anything, maybe I'll have a glass of wine. But I really was overindulging myself on this vacation. But we only gone for five days, four nights. It was too short in five days. So this was just my diet for about five days. And I did gain back the three pounds that I lost. But let's see if we get some, oh, Pauline, Pauline is here. Let's see if Pauline is. Hey, Mike, I took a break from fasting and working out but gain back a few pounds, not getting, that's great. No, but I think it's good, Pauline. I think that's exactly what you want to do, especially if you kind of plan it and you kind of know that you did it. It's kind of upsetting when all of a sudden, like you've been fasting and doing everything right, and then you gain some weight back, right? But if you knew that you maybe went off a little bit, now it's time to get back. And maybe you just needed a break. Maybe you needed to up your calories. Maybe you needed to take a break. Maybe your joints, your back, your neck, your knees needed a break from working out. So it's time to get back into it. I totally agree. Okay, let's see what Gene's saying in here too. Gene, I'm trying the keto diet and I'm struggling to get rid of the delicious, I know, I, tell me about it. I'm gonna talk about what happened to me when I got back because I was eating these like these garlic knots, these sandwiches on the beach every single day. It, it, it's, it's amazing how I'm pretty, I'm fat, I consider myself pretty much fat adapted. Like you know how I eat if you follow me. I eat a relatively, relatively pretty low carb diet. Very rarely have the breads, the pastas. I eat a whole natural food diet. More like this plate here without the potatoes, like just vegetables and and proteins. But just the fact that I was eating bread every single day of those sandwiches on the beach and I having these garlic nuts and drinking beer, within five days, I had a crazy craving for bread. And, I, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of what happened to me when I got back. So I could imagine if you've been like eating like this for a decade or more, you, you know, you're probably insulin resistant. Your food and sugar cravings are just so intense. It can be so difficult, but you just have to ease your way out of it. And my opinion, definitely, that low carb, whole natural food diet really is the way to go. Okay, so let's talk about some. So this is what I was doing the whole trip. You know, so I come back from vacation. I feel nice and rested, feel great, but I'm about three pounds heavier, and I have to say, I got a little bit of a craving now for breads and things like that. 
So this was my plan for post vacation. Like this is my plan when I'm going back to the gym. Like typically there's another mistake I used to make. When I was younger and I would come back on vacation, say I missed a week of working out, I would like I'd kill myself in the gym, go full force. I feel nauseous. I never do that anymore. So when it comes to the working out, I just ease my way back into working out. Like I, like a Monday I did a nice full body routine, only one set per exercise. Typically I do two or three. You know, I took it easy with the cardio. I have to say, I'm in, now I'm a week and a half back. I'm pretty much back to normal. But I really did ease myself back into it. That's a, that's what I recommend when it comes to working out. Ease yourself back into it. You know, just just do cut back on the volume and the intensity at least for the first week because you have muscle memory. It comes right back. Okay, and this is what my plan. I was a little disappointed that I didn't take a break from fasting when I was on vacation. So what I wanted to do is I was going to experiment my first week back. Instead of fasting, instead of doing like a typical 16-8 or 18-6, like if you know, if you follow me once again, you know what I love to do. I like to vary my intermittent fasting strategy almost every day. Like I like to do maybe a 16-8 on Monday. I like to do maybe an 18-hour fast on Tuesday, maybe a 20-hour fast on Wednesday. Then Thursday, I may jump back up to a 16-8. Plus, I, I, because I'm always cycling my calories. To me, that is the key for this intermittent fasting things to work for you a long time. You can't always be restricting calories. There are some times when you should eat less. Other days, you should go to maintenance and eat more. And it kind of happens automatically when you keep on changing your fasting strategy. I Meaning that if you do 16-8, say on a Monday and eat three meals, that can be say your up calorie day. But then Wednesday, if I'm doing a 20 hour fast with only two meals, I'm restricting calories. And that I think is ideal. Plus you can even pace your intermittent fasting strategy with, what, with how you're working out. So on the days that I'm doing resistance training, that might be a 16-8 day because I know I'm eating more. But if I'm just doing say a two hour walk, that's my cardio day. That's a perfect day to do like a 20 hour fast and only eat like one and a half meals. Let's see what Mike, Mike's got a question here. Okay, I found that when I have overtrained in the past, I have sometimes actually gained weight. It's interesting. I put it down to eating a lot more and lack of control. So I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting. It is a couple things that could be. First of all, when you work out hard, I just had a conversation with, I like, did a video conference call with someone. And he was telling me that when he does his, his high intensity cardio, even though he's burning more calories, he is ravenously hungry. So that's one thing. There's no question about it. High intensity type training, working out hard, definitely makes you hungry. Plus, it creates inflammation in the body to some degree. See, there's an optimal dose of exercise. If you're hitting it too hard, you can almost create like a toxic inflammatory state within your body. And maybe you can even hold more water. I've seen that happen to people who like never worked that before. They start working out. The first week they gain a little bit of weight because of the inflammation from the work and then maybe they're too sore. It's like it's also not good to be sore every time you work out. It's too much of a training effect. A little I like to say the ideal workout is when the next day you have an awareness that you worked out, meaning that your posture is good, you feel maybe a little pumped up, you just feel good. But you shouldn't be so sore that you can't do anything the next day. The soreness should never interfere with your normal life. If that's happening, and I did that for 20 years of my life, I was chronically sore all through my late teens, 20s, and early 30s. I worked out way too hard, too often. We felt like if you didn't get sore, you didn't get a workout. And it took me a while to really understand that. And in the last 20 years, once I get into my 40s, I really smartened up about all these things, okay? So like I said, let's go back to my, like, my first week back. So just to review quickly, Pre-vacation, I did that. Then I did my vacation week. Now I'm back, back in the gym, back home the first week. And I was said I was a little disappointed that I didn't stop fasting for the week that I was on vacation. So I decided that my first week back. Uh, thanks, Mike. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad you agree. So my first week back, I said, you know, I'm not going to fast this week. I'm going to take five days off from fasting. And what I'm going to do, I'm not looking to eat like a high carb type breakfast. Obviously, I said I'm going to have two or three hard boiled eggs first thing in the morning. You know, just a little protein and fat and like pasteurized eggs, you know, you get the good, you get the good omega feast from the pasteurized eggs. It's not gonna give me too much of a spike in insulin. Plus I was curious to see, this is my first week back, you know, working out, maybe I need a little bit more energy. So I have to say, I, I couldn't make the five days once again, right? I made four days. And I have to say, it didn't really, I didn't feel there was much benefit or negativity. Like I didn't feel like I had more energy I'm typically not hungry in the morning, so sometimes I wasn't even in the mood for the eggs. But I ate them, and it was kind of an interesting experiment. I would say I, I would say it was neutral. 
you know, I, 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 and I only did it for four days. So I'll tell you what I did the fifth day, but let me continue with this. I, I, what I really want to point out, like I was talking about before, is that I couldn't believe that in just like eating breads and, you know, Italian food for five short days that I had such a craving for bread that I had a hard time a little bit that first day going back to my normal eating. So I'm, I'm going to click to like, this is typically like what I would have minus these breadsticks. So this was like, I, I, after having my two eggs in the morning, you know, I worked out and this is how I broke my, I wouldn't say breaking my fast because I had my eggs, but this was my first real meal of the day. And this is how I typically would eat, right? I would eat my smoked salmon, you know, six ounces or so of smoked salmon. I'd have my seasonal blueberries and I have half an avocado or maybe a whole avocado. But to me, it wasn't enough. And my wife keeps these, these like salted, like bread crackers, you know, in the house. And I had a three, I had three or four crackers. I just felt like I just couldn't resist it, which says to me, I can imagine what a hard time people have. I forgot, you know, sometimes, sometimes I forget what it is like to crave sugar, to crave, to crave bread, to crave these things, because I so rarely eat them. And bread really is a trigger food for me. I always tell everyone, you know, you got to take 10, 15 minutes one day, sit down, write down all your trigger foods, write down all the foods, those negative foods. And I'm not talking about broccoli, right? <laughs> We're talking like cookies, cakes, for me it's potatoes of two, breadsticks, whatever foods that when you start eating them, you start eating them, you can't stop. Those are the foods you got to just eliminate from your diet like 90% of the time, if not more. Save it for your birthday, piece of cake, save it, you know, save it for vacation, but get these trigger foods out of the house. So I'm, I'm told my wife after she, I don't really eat these, my kids eat these and my wife eats them. I'm, I'm just gonna tell her, Let's get these out of the house for a while. So I only did that the first day. And then I had a, 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 I had a normal dinner and then I just toughed it out. By Tuesday, I really, I, I just convinced myself that's it. I'm back to my normal core diet. Let's see what Mike's, Mike's got here. Okay, bread has been the enemy for years. I know, crazy cravings when I eat it. I've learned to stay clear. I know you just have it. You just can't keep it in the house. And you know, also when, like, say, let's let's say milk chocolate is one of your trigger foods, or or, or donuts. Like you you love Dunkin' Dunkin' Donuts. Tell your family, family, your loved ones, your friends, do not bring you these foods. The people think, like, you know, my when I first met my wife, she knew that I loved potato chips. This is like 30 years ago. So she'd be bringing me home potato chips all the time. I was eating bags of potato chips. I said to me, Rose, please, I, I, I appreciate you, you know, bringing me the things you think I want, but I don't want potato chips in my life. So you have to also tell your friends, do not bring you your trigger foods. Let's see what Jean's got to say. Why separate cardio days with resistance days? Couldn't I do them both on the same day, like 20 minutes for each? Oh yeah, I, I thought so, Jean, but I thought you said in that first comment, you only have 30 minutes. If you only have 30 minutes, but if you have 40 minutes, I think you definitely can. But look at it like this too. Whatever you do first, you're gonna have more energy for and you're gonna prioritize. Like people always ask me, oh, should I do my, if you're doing them on both days, should I do my cardio first, should I do my resistance training first? Depends on what your goal is. Like when you do, for example, when you do resistance training, Say you do your resistance training first, you have a lot of energy, you're gonna get a good workout, plus you're gonna burn up carbohydrates because you're working those fast switch fibers, right? You're gonna be dipping into stored glycogen in your muscle cells. So if your goal is like put on muscle and maybe burn some body fat, it might make sense to first do your resistance training. Now you're gonna go into your cardio workout, right? With like low, you know, like low glycogen, like low carbohydrate in your system, so maybe you're burning a greater percentage of fat, but you could do both. But I, I always like to prioritize, like get the best of both. There's almost like, sometimes I explain like this, like say you're a cyclist, right? You like the bicycle, you can, ha you can buy like a, a mountain bike that's really good in the mountains, right? You can buy a race bike that's really fast and good for racing in the street, or you can buy one of those like in between, you know, those hybrid bikes that kinda, they're okay in the mountains, they're okay for racing and they're kind of okay on the street, but they're not great at everything. When it comes to like exercise, I like to like, you know, dig in and prioritize what I'm doing. When I'm doing my resistance training, I like to just focus on that. When I'm doing my cardio, I like to focus on that. If you try to do everything, it, you know, it's still good for general fitness, but you're not gonna, in my opinion, you're not gonna be able to maximize each of them. But it really depends on what your goals and what you're looking to do. It's fine to do them both. But actually, if you're gonna do them both, one day do cardio first, next day do resistance training, kind of mix it up, because whatever you do first, you're gonna have more energy for, for sure. Let's see, oh, Brent's back. Oh, great, Brent, how you doing? Ireland, yes, I love Ireland. Okay, here Brent said, 
fast 18 hours a day and find I have to force myself to eat because I have no, yeah, it's really incredible. Once you get used to this fasting, but that's when you also have to be a little careful, Brett, like I always talk about. And I do myself too. You can get caught up real deep into this fasting, yeah, especially if you're fat adapted and you can just like never be hungry. But still, it's important to make sure you're cycling your calories. You can go a few weeks like that, but then take a break. You don't have to go on vacation to take a break. Just take a break off for a week, up your calories to at least maintenance. Or start doing it intermittently. You know, do like an 18 hour fast one day, then maybe the next day do a 16 hour fast. And then maybe the next day do a 20 hour fast, but mix it up. Don't get stuck in the same strategy for too long, okay? So like I told you, so like I had a hard time my first day back. Let's see, Brent, let's see, what's Brent's got? Mike, I take supplements in the morning, but they're, they're, they, they are in capsule form. You know, it's okay. Do they break a fast? You know, generally supplements generally don't. Now, obviously if you're taking a protein powder or something like that, but you're taking like just a multivitamin or like a fish oil may break uh, fast. See, I personally like to take my supplements with my first meal, which is generally lunchtime. But I think it's okay. Like I also talk about, and I've done other videos about this, like some people like to, when it comes to like doing resistance training in a fasted state, I typically either will do a protein type shake or sometimes, and that will break the fast, but not much, a little bit, but sometimes people take essential amino acids, which pretty much won't break a fast, like branch chain amino acids. So you're pretty much getting the amino acids, the protein, without like almost no calories. So that's something you might want to do. But I generally think that when you're taking like a multi, I think you should take it with food or take it with food. It kind of enhances the food. Plus there's so many different things in food itself, the combinations that I think the vitamins and the supplements just work better with it. Unless you're just doing like a protein shake and it's gonna be like a meal replacement type thing, which is obviously fine. Like if you're not fasting that day and you're doing a protein shake in the morning, you can take your supplements or something too, obviously, right? Okay, so let's talk about some of the other, um, some of my other meals when I when I came back from vacation. So, so like you heard about my first day where I had my crazy, and this is now I was back on track. This is like Tuesday. I'm back on track eating my low carb whole natural food diet. I was prioritizing protein a little, but I had a nice piece of salmon here. This was left over from the night before. Love my sardines. You guys know I love sardines. Blueberries, little poly polyphenols there, seasonal fruits. So I'm gonna be stopping the berries. Well, I stopped them this week, but I did. I'll, I'll talk about that later in this video. And actually the tomatoes have been like incredible. This is like tomato season. These tomatoes are fruit, obviously, but it's a pretty low sugar fruit. Love it, tomato, avocado sad salad. So by like Tuesday, I'm kind of back in the groove. You know, I'm, I'm still taking it easy in the gym, but the diet's really, really falling in line. I'll give you like another example of like a typical, another typical meal. Let's see if we can close this out. Let's see what we got here. Let me close this one. I think I, there, there, I think I had one other different. Maybe, maybe I only showed you two meals. Okay, so pretty much by the end of that week, the interesting thing is, is that um, I I lost about two pounds that week, which is I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So, for example, remember that pre-vacation I tightened on my diet, I lost about three pounds, gained the three pounds back, and then I lost two pounds following this plan the week back. And I don't know if you've been following all all my community posts and all that. You know, I'm turning 59 at the end of August. I did like a couple of before and after pictures. I was a little disappointed over this pandemic that I know always typically for years would keep my body fat just low enough so you see my six pack, you know, right around that 10% level. But I found that over the pandemic, my body weight kind of creeped up. So I really wanted to go for it this year before I turned 59. And I, I feel like, I don't know if I'm gonna get it. I mean, I, I did a picture a couple of weeks ago that, you know, the six pack was coming back a little bit, but I'm probably more at that 12% body fat. But I feel like I got thrown off a little bit. I also tweaked my neck a few weeks ago, which kind of affected my training. So uh, the fact that I gained back two pounds, you know, I, 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 I was hoping maybe to keep it off. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, I, let me show you what I'm doing now. What I'm doing now, okay, so now I'm back, I'm pretty much back in the groove, right? So now I started this, what's today? Today is the 10th, today is, is Tuesday, right? I started this yesterday. No, no, I started this on Monday. I started this on Monday or, or maybe even Sunday. I, I remember, I, I decided I'm gonna do, uh, let, me see, let me see first what Gene has to say here. Gene, Mike, my, my first priority is to lose weight. I'm 280 pounds, looking to lose 80 pounds by Christmas. 
So should my training focus more on cardio resistance training? I would definitely, if I had to quickly say, I would say resistance training, and I would say diet is gonna be like 90% of it. You, you know, you gotta, I, I would definitely do the low carb, whole food, natural diet tip. It's just very similar to how I eat. You know, I would go anywhere from 10 times your body weight, so like, like, 2,090 calories a day in your calorie restricted days. I think you can even go maybe less than that, maybe about 2,500 calories. Restrict calories, then jump up the maintenance. Go like 2,500 calories with like a 16, 8, 2, 3 meals a day, and then, you know, go to maintenance. Go to like 3,200 3, calories, 3,300 3, calories, and keep on cycling that. And then definitely do your cardio too. But I would look, and the resistance training is going to maintain your muscle mass, but you're a big guy. Do all your exercise should be done to create the response you want, meaning that you're doing your resistance training to maintain your muscle mass, just to look muscular and fit. I like to look muscular and fit. You know, I want to look, you know, like a little, I like that little bit of a bodybuilder look. I'm not sure what you're looking to look like. And then you want to do your cardio for a strong heart. You know, we're getting older. You want a high VO2 max. You, you know, want to be in good, healthy shape. I would rather you look at your exercise more like that. But when it comes to losing weight, do it mostly with diet. In and out of a calorie deficit, the intermittent fasting is an incredible strategy. Whole natural food diet. Like I always talk about three ways you control your weight. Food quality, right? If you're eating 2,000 calories of cookies, cakes, and junk compared to 2,000 calories of like whole natural food like salmon, avocado, vegetables, you're going to be healthy. You're going to be thinner eating better food. Food quality, number one. Number two, calories. Calories count, right? You got to go into a calorie deficit to lose weight up to maintain the cycle your calories. And number three, food timing. You know, do you have to go through periods of the day when you're in a fasted state or an empty stomach? It could be as simple as for some people just sleeping eight hours and then just eating breakfast a little later, a little dinner a little early, and just fasting for 12 hours is actually really good. But you have to have an empty stomach at different times during the day to dip into stored energy. Because even if you're eating good food, even if your calories are somewhat in line, but you're eating throughout the whole day and always spiking insulin and always in storage mode, not that you can't do it, but you're creating an environment for your body to make it really difficult for you to dip into fat stores. So exercise to be healthy, to be muscular, to be flexible, to have mobility, to have a strong heart and strong cardiovascular system, and eat in a way to control your weight. The key to controlling your weight is more what you diet, in my opinion, than exercise. And then an active lifestyle. Now, instead of someone just fidgeting, you know, keeping your room colder, moving around, always walking, just live an active lifestyle, right? Eat a whole natural food diet, and then just create the response you want in the gym. I think that's the best way to do it, okay? So let's talk about this carnivore diet that I decided to do. So I'm my second week back from vacation, you know, I, I was getting a little concerned that maybe I wouldn't make my goal of getting my six pack back in the next couple of weeks from 59. So I decided to maybe try something a little bit extreme. I may not stick with it, but I've done it like three days in a row now. So I think I, sometimes I'm doing these live streams. I even think of what day it is. Let me look at my phone. It says today is, today is Wednesday or Tuesday. I'll tell you it's Tuesday. So I must have started on Sunday. So I did this Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, three days. And I'm doing like a modified version of the carnivore diet. Like if you're not familiar with the carnivore diet, it's kind of an extreme diet. Carnivore means that you pretty much eat all meat type products. But there's all different ways to do it. The most extreme way to do it. And if you I follow a couple of guys that are that are really into this. The one doctor, Dr. Paul Saladino, I read his book, The Carnivore is Great. I think it's called the Carnivore called Great Book. And another doctor named me, Surgeon Sean Baker. These are like the famous carnivore guys and they're doctors, they're in amazing shape. They've been on the carnivore diet for many years, and they and they you know they coach people, and they're real experts on it. So the extreme way of doing it is literally to only eat meat, like chicken, fish, meat, like you know fish, and just water. And the reason why you might want to do is a multiple reason. A lot of people who have like autoimmune type issues or like irritable bowel, colitis, and a lot of people feel like. There's so many, there's so much toxins, there's lectins, you know, Dr. Dr. Steve Gundry says all these vegetables, the nightshades, the grains, the wheat, all these things have a lot of like toxins and lectins in there that really affect your gut, your microbiome. These carnivore doctors and people who write these books don't think you need fiber. That's the thing I, I, I'm hooked on because I do love, I do think you do need fiber. But if you want to do a strict carnivore, it would really just be like meat and they want you to eat organ meats head to toe because like liver's high in vitamin C and just water, but that's pretty extreme. What I decided to do, let's see. Let me see, I think Gene's got another question and I'll continue with this, let's see. If I do 30 minutes a day, five days a week consistently for 20 minutes of resistance training and 10 minutes of cardio, 
with two 30 seconds hits. I think, yeah, I, I, I like that. <laughs> I, I like that, Gene. So you're getting your nice good resistance training, and then you're doing a, a, a couple of good, nice, hard intervals to get your VO2 your max up. Love it. I think that's a great plan. And then just do the other stuff we talked about. Eat that whole natural food diet, cycle your calories, and I think you'll reach your goal by Christmas. But I would love to see, I'd love to see a before and after picture. You don't have to show it to me now. Take a picture of yourself now and then take a picture and show me Christmas. But, you know, ask me a bunch of questions. I'm going to be doing these lives every single week, so we'll talk about it along the way. Okay? So what I decided to do is I didn't want to go that extreme with the carnivore diet because I have to say I just can't get the concept that fiber is not good for you. Like for example, Joe Rogan, I don't know if you follow Joe Rogan, he has that, probably the most popular podcast. I heard he just sold it for like $50 million, his podcast to you know like a major network. I listen to him all the time and he did the carnivore diet, strict carnivore, just like meat and water for, for a month, about a year ago. And he lost, you know, like 10, 15 pounds. He always, you know, he's a super fit, really smart guy when it comes to fitness and nutrition and all that stuff. And he can never really get his body fat low but he did the carnivore diet for a month and he really lowered his body fat and it was the exact opposite I thought you would get constipated from no five he said the exact opposite about two weeks into it he, he couldn't control his bowels had diarrhea and I hear that's common I also heard Ben Greenfeld from Ben Greenfeld Fitness talk about the carnivore diet like that, that he did the same thing he normally eats a high fiber diet and he with no fiber his bowel movements were great everything was good it's kind of surprised me but I can't just just with all the schooling and everything I've heard about fiber, it feeds the good bacteria in your stomach, the bi-rate, the small chain fatty acids. I'm not going to eliminate all fiber from my diet. So in Dr. Paul Saladino's book, that carnivore code, and he even has it on his website. Below this video, I'll, I'll put a link if you want to check it out. He talks about the different tiers in which you can do the carnivore diet. Now, I'm not doing it for autoimmune I'm really doing it to maybe lower my body fat. You know, I'll probably be in a state of ketosis. Maybe not because I'll be eating so much protein. Kind of hard to say. I'm sure there'll be some gluconeogenesis where proteins could be converted into carbohydrates to some because I'm going to be eating so much protein. But, uh, you know, but I also have this other weird thing. I also get like a couple of skin conditions that I think um, people say the carnivore diet is really, is really good at. So, you know, I'm doing it for multiple reasons, but the main thing is, is to lower my body fat. And I'm curious, you, and as an experiment, because people ask me about the carnivore diet all the time, and if I don't try it to some degree, it's hard for me to be to give my educated opinion on it. But I'm going to start off with the tier one. A tier one is a little less restricted, meaning that most of my diet, I'm going to show you a picture of what I've been eating. Most of my diet is going to be beef, bison, lamb, meat, chicken, fish, eggs, and they even allow some dairy. Even though a lot of people who go on carnival avoid dairy because dairy seems to create inflammation for a lot of people and lactose intolerance. I'm actually I am lactose intolerant. Like I can eat like yogurt, but I couldn't drink a glass of milk. I can have fermented dairy. I can have like hard cheeses. But even ice cream sometimes can upset my stomach a little bit. But on the tier one, you're allowed to have all these meats, but you're also allowed to have some other things that do have some fiber. You're allowed to have olives, avocado. You can have lettuce. You can have cucumber, but they want you to remove the skin and the seeds. That's like a Dr. Gundry thing because the lectins are in the skin and the seeds. That's same as tomatoes. The nightshades, like, it's the seeds of the tomato that, that, that are so high in the lectins. And actually, squash is also a pretty low lectin type vegetable. So if you, so I've been doing this now for three days. And, and actually, I got to say, I feel pretty good. I think for, for someone just who's not used to a low carb type diet to go into something like this, is they're going to have a hard time the first, first few days. But I'm so used to eating a relatively low carb diet. It wasn't that hard for me. The hardest thing for me, initially, the first couple of days, and I still feel it to some degree, is first of all, I really was enjoying those seasonal berries, like the blueberries and strawberries. I generally only eat them in the summer anyway. So I would have stopped because I, I like to keep an eye on my fructose. So, and I just love the berries seasonally. So I probably would have stopped the berries by the end of the summer anyway because they'd be going out of season. Um, but sometimes I replace them with tomatoes, which I, you know, I love tomatoes, which is a similar type thing. And the other thing that I'm really missing, though, I got to tell you, is the dark chocolate. I mean, I, I love, I buy this 88% dark chocolate. I also did a video about like my, my 10 like health foods you should eat. And I do think dark chocolate is good for you. High magnesium, you know, high in fiber. Actually, polyphenols, a lot of flavonoids, a lot of the good stuff I think is in dark chocolate, but it has to be, it can't be milk chocolate. Now we're talking, people say 70%, but I think you gotta be 85% or higher. I buy this one brand um, that's 88% dark chocolate. Check out that video, I think you, you will, you'll really like it. 
and and that's when I'm really still craving. I don't know if I'll ever get rid of that craving because I just love it. Maybe it's the endorphins from the caffeine, the cocoa bean that I don't think I'll ever, even if I did this carnivore for a long time, I think I'm always gonna crave dark chocolate, I just love it. But let me give you an idea, an idea of some of the uh, food. So this was like the first, the first meal I had. I had, a, it doesn't look like much, this is a pound of wild caught shrimp. Right, so a general rule, every four ounces of chicken, fish, and meat, about 25 grams of protein. So I literally got 100 grams of protein right here. And you may not be able to see it, but there's a little bit of oil, um, olive oil drizzled on. And they're not even that crazy about extra virgin olive oil on the um, on the carnivore diet. But with the tier one, you're allowed to have it. Because obviously, you can have olives, you can have olive oil. And then I have a whole avocado here. So I'm still getting a reasonable amount of fiber. Just about, it depends on how big the avocado is, maybe 15, 17 grams of fiber. Plus, I'm also a big believer, and these are what the carnivore, like doctors don't think you need either, is I'm a big believer in getting enough potassium in your diet. So this avocado has about 900 milligrams of potassium. I typically eat upwards of 4,000. You know, but I have to say, these are small guys. I'm sure if I debated like Paul Saladino or Dr. Sean Bake, I'm sure I couldn't keep up with them because they, they'll go into the cellular level and, and they'll go into why you don't need this. And, 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 you know, they talk about how your body will produce these micronutrients on their own. And it, it, it gets complex, but I still think you need potassium. I still think you need magnesium. I still think you need fiber in your diet. Maybe, maybe I'll change my mind down the road. But right now, that's the camp that I'm in. So this is like one of my first meals. Okay, let's see what Gene's got to say here now. If I eat three meals a day, how about two meals low carb and maybe one meal will I have bread, pasta within reason? Within reason, I think that sounds good. But one, like, if you can do that, try to do that post workout. I know it might be hard. And if you're working out at lunchtime or something like that, but you could just think when you're working out, you're depleting glycogen. If you could, the whole trick is if you're going to be eating breads and pastas, right? You don't want your glycogen levels like like when you eat those excess carbohydrates. Like, like say you're having a big bowl of pasta, Italian bread, or even within reason. The whole thing is you're a pretty big guy, 290 pounds. Maybe you can store 2,500, 3,000 calories of carbohydrates in your muscles and in your liver in the form of glycogen. The whole trick, Gene, is you want to deplete your glycogen levels and then fill them up. You just don't want to eat that pasta, bread, and things like that. If your muscles are full with glycogen, like you got that 2,500 calories stored in your muscles already, that bread is gonna be converted into, into body fat, triglycerides and into body fat. So if you can keep those glycogen levels low enough and kind of eat that ideal amount, amount of carbs, I think you'll be okay. If you're active like you're talking about and two meals are low carb, you can probably get away with one meal. You probably could. I mean, do it and see how it goes. You know? and, and, and we'll talk as we go, but I think you can, you can possibly get away with it for sure. Okay, so this was my first one. Let me give a couple examples of some other things. This is what I had. Um, let's see, let's shut this one down. And then another thing. Yeah, this is what I had today. Actually, I had very similar. I had two grass-fed, grass-finished um, hamburger patties. You know, actually, I like it. Actually, chopped meat, you can argue, is all, might be more healthy than... Um, like eating a steak or something because you're eating the connective tissue, you know, with the chop meat. They grind everything up. You know, when you eat, like true carnivore, they do want you to, you know, head to toe. I mean, they want you to have organ meats, connective tissue, things like that. Um, like I said, a lot of people who don't like the carnivore diet say that, oh, it's too low in vitamin C. You're not getting any vitamin C, but organ meats like liver are high in vitamin C. So I might start fooling around with a little bit of organ meats too. But And then I had chicken and one chicken my avocado because I want the fiber. And then I think yesterday's I think yesterday's meal was really was really similar too, but I threw in because I'm, I also want to keep up. I also want to keep up my omega three. So let me see if I got my sardine meal here too. This is what I had I think yesterday, I, and and I'm just showing you my lunch. I didn't show you my dinner, so I like sardines. I do want to keep my omega threes up even on this on this modified tier one carnivore. Then I had some chicken thighs and once again my avocado. So I'm gonna fool around with this. I'm definitely gonna do this for this week. I feel really good. Like I said, I craved bread a little bit. No, not bread. I craved the berries a little bit the first day. And now I'm just craving the dark chocolate. I love the dark chocolate and I don't know if that's gonna go away. So I'm gonna do this for this week. And then I'm gonna make a decision for next week. It's either I'm gonna go deeper and really try to eliminate like the avocado and eliminate the fiber and really just go meat, you know, chicken, fish, eggs, meat, and things like that for one more week and see if it happens. I'm just concerned. I'm so used, my system's so used to fiber. I don't know how I'm going to react to it. 
you know, like I'm not gonna get constipated. I'm like, something's gonna happen. So I, you know, I don't want to jam myself up like that. But I might do it. We'll see. I want to see how I feel. But I feel like I'm getting already. I'm feeling a little leaner. Uh, you know, I felt pretty good. I had good energy in the gym today. I did a resistance training workout yesterday. Felt good. I did my cardio. Did my harder like hit cardio today with a little bit of core work. Felt pretty good. You know, we'll see how it goes. Let's see. Let's see, Brian's got a question here. Brian Green. Let's see. Mike, what's your opinion on kettlebell training? Does it combine resistance? You no, know, I think kettlebell training. I I think it's it's good. I typically, you know, I have to say, you know, I've been lifting weights from the age of sixteen, and I've and I remember kettlebells years ago was actually a little popular. Now, obviously, it's been such a popular thing the last fifteen years. I never truly got into kettlebell training like i will do like just just simple i know you watch these guys on on youtube and you know they're like incredible they you know they, they're almost like um you know gymnasts what they can do with these kettlebells i do the classic kettlebell swing and then i actually do a couple of cool like resistance training things with it i, I like upside down um shoulder presses i got a couple of videos on that you know when you when you when you flip the kettlebell upside down because it really works on your grip strength which I love. And I even do sometimes, you know who's into this too? Stuart McGill. And I do it too. Sometimes I'll take a heavy kettlebell and I'll hold it like this and I just walk with it. So for example, when I'm holding it on my left hand, it's a great challenge for quadrilumborum for your, like your core on the opposing side. And I got herniated disc and all my lower back. So I don't really load my back. I'll load my section. Like you won't, you'll never see me doing hard, heavy, like crunches like with weight i may do a little bit off of a swiss ball just to get a little bit of a stretch but i like to challenge my core more with non-movement type exercise and those and those kettlebell carries a great kettlebell swing but i, I but i do like it and it is a, as like you're saying it is a combination of cardio it's almost like doing like an interval and then you take a break because your heart's going to skyrocket and it's going to come right back down you know, it's almost like doing jumping jacks. And just another little, little trivia, you know who invented the jumping jack? Jack Elaine, right? Jumping jacks, that's why they're not called, called jumping mice, right? I, I was a big fan of, of Jack Elaine. That's what almost got me interested in fitness. When I was a kid, me and my grandmother would watch Jack Elaine all the time. And he had the bands, my grandmother. You know, Jack Elaine, he like invented everything. He invented the selectorized equipment. You know, when you put a pin in the Universal, Jack Elaine invented that. Carnation Instant Breakfast, he invented the first protein shake, Carnation Instant Breakfast. This is a rumor, but I think it's true. Stole it from him. And it, it, Jacqueline was like so ahead of his time. But no, I think kettlebell training is great, but I, but it's not something that I would consider myself a true expert in. But, you know, I do, I do, but I do do some basic movements. I really do. Like, you know, your heart, you know, I just do that basic kettlebell swing. Your heart just skyrockets. You, my heart gets up to 160 beats like in no time. But I never did, you know, those typical classic cleans and you know that people do with it. I never really got into that. Okay. Okay. So let's go back. So that, that's basically what I've been doing. And like I'm saying, I'm going to do this all this week, this carnivore thing. And plus, I've also, like I said, I'm increasing the intensity of my workouts because now I'm kind of like three and a half back for vacations. And then on Sunday. I'm going to decide. And Sunday is no, my normal, typical OMAD day where I normally would maybe eat some other things. I'm not sure. I may just stick with this carnivore type thing with tier one. And then Monday, going forward, I'm going to decide. Either I'm going to go strict carnivore for a week and see if I can do it and maybe get my body fat real low and take a picture when I'm turning 59. Or I may stay with this and just go back to my normal low carb. But I'm going to do this for a week. You know, because I have to do it because so many people ask me about it. Now, let's see if we're going Oh, cheers. Oh, thank you. Oh, thanks, my cheers. Well, where are you from, Brian? You from Australia? Cheers. That would be cool. You get people from all, all over the world. That's great. Uh, all right, cool. Okay, so let's go let, Let's go into a Q&A. Any questions about anything? Guys and gals, anything fitness, health, weight loss, anything you want to know about? I like to do. I like to stay on for about an hour, it seems. I'm on like 45 minutes a month. Boy, we just hit 46 minutes now. It seems like to also to the YouTube algorithm, like the longest thing. And also, I should I should ask you this earlier. If you can hit the thumbs up, I, I normally don't ask that. If you if you watch my videos, you know, I de generally never tell people subscribe to my channel because I just I don't know. I, if you want to subscribe, you subscribe, right? And I generally tell, don't tell people give me a thumbs up either. I did it in some of my earlier videos, but everyone's telling me that when you do these live streams, that the only way YouTube is going to show them to more people is if people like. 
do hit the thumbs up button or start sharing it. So if you know anyone who has any questions about fitness, health, weight loss, nutrition, you know, share it, share them, share them this link, and they'll jump into the room, they can answer some questions and give me the thumbs up so YouTube shows it to other people. But let's see, you know, but sometimes also the questions take a little extra time to come in. So let's see what Gene's got here. What's your opinion on calisthenic exercises or push-ups? I think I think definitely, especially a, a guy your size, Gene, two, you know, 290. I think you can get a lot out of a push-up. To this day, see, I personally, this is my thing with push-ups. I mean, I love push-ups. You know, you may have a hard time doing pull-ups because you know there's a lot, of, you know, there's a lot of weight to move. Even me, I don't do, I don't do too many pull-ups. I do mostly a lot pull down because I like to use a parallel grip. Also, I broke my elbow. I was more of an extreme athlete as a kid. I broke my elbow pretty bad skateboarding as a kid. My elbow always bothered me. So sometimes pull-ups at full extension, my elbow catches and and it bothers me a little bit. So I do, I do more. A lot pull down, but this is how I like to do push-ups. I, I I almost look at my repetitions more as time under load. Okay, me and that. Let's say I'm doing a five-second rep cadence. That means I'm low myself three seconds, rising rising for two seconds. So it's a five-second rep. So if I do twelve reps, it's sixty seconds under load. If I'm doing like a calisthenic type movement, well, I might find that. It's not that challenging because I could probably do a lot of pushes if I want to. I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to do an extremely slow rep cadence. So I like this. I like to do ten, only ten or twelve push-ups, but it's pretty taxing if you use an extreme rep cadence. So, for example, I may do a ten-second eccentric. I may lower myself so slowly for ten seconds, pause on the bottom of a push-up, and then come up for five seconds, do a fifteen-second rep. Do ten reps like that. It's like bench pressing three hundred pounds. I mean, it's just it's 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 a it's a great challenge. Same thing like you know I got like you may have heard I also I also got a bad knee. I got and I got a bad knee from a um, bad meniscus operation I had like 10, 12 years ago. I used to squat four hundred pounds for reps. You know, like I I think I was I, I think I can do like a triple when I was one hundred sixty two pounds. I I mean I used to do three fifteen twenty reps like nothing for most of my life. I had this operation. 10, 12 years ago, my knee's never been right. I had multiple different opinions. I'm gonna do a whole live stream about, about my knee. Not to, not to complain more about like what you should and shouldn't ask when dealing with surgeons and, and, and some of the issues I have and what I'm doing now to work around a bad, a bad knee. But I don't really, I can't squat heavy weight anymore. It just bothers my knee. But I'll do, even sometimes I'll do just body weight squats really slowly. Like when it's like 10 seconds down, pause, Five seconds up. You know, I may hold some some dumbbells in my hands too, but you can get a lot done with calisthenics, no doubt. You can get a lot done with bands, just those resistance bands. I do a lot of training with resistance bands. It's interesting, you know, those. I I generally buy the Spree brand. When you buy, like, the interesting thing about bands is that as they elongate, they get harder. And there are certain exercises where that makes more sense. Similarly, like you ever see people squat with a bar and they put chains on the bar. Like, why do they do that? Because when you squat down and you're at like 90 degrees with your knees and your hips, that's probably your weakest position within the squat. So if you have chains on the bar, the bar gets lighter, right? So when you get stronger, like biomechanically, you get stronger, like the moment on the leverage of when you're squatting, when you're standing, the chains lift off the ground and it gets heavier. Perfect thing, that's kind of like how bands work. And that's how like when you're doing a bench press, Right, you, you, your sticking point, your weakest point is probably down here. If you're using a band to do like a pressing motion, they're gonna get harder when you get stronger. Like it makes sense. Bands are great. They're great movements. Great for rotate. Great for rehab. Great for everything. And they're so inexpensive. I do a lot of band work. I actually, I actually seen Sylvester Stallone actually. Who I follow him on Instagram. He did a video saying, you know, you lift weights, you're gonna get hurt. You know, he's, and he's been lifting weights like me even long. He's in his 70s. He looks amazing too. But he said, you lift weights, no matter how much you know, it's just how it is, you're going to hurt yourself eventually. And, it, and to some degree, that's true. I mean, but he said, with the bands, you don't get hurt. You know, it, the tension's a little bit different. I would fool around with bands for sure. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's see. What about, how about 10 regular push-ups and then immediately followed by 10? Yeah, I think that's fine. Like, like It's just like a drop-down set. Definitely, you can do 10 off your toes, drop to your knees, bang out 10, right? You're gonna do 10 full range of motion push-ups, going nice and deep, 10 partial range motion push-ups, go halfway down. Just it just keeping the set, time under load lasting longer, I think those are all great. 
I'm gonna do more videos on that too, like all different ways to make a workout harder without necessarily making the weight heavier. Let's see, let's see what Brent got here. How does one determine how many calories per day? Okay, this is like my general rules. When it comes to like losing weight and being in a calorie deficit, I kind of like the general rule of 10 to 11 times your body weight. So if you're 150 pounds, maybe 1,500 to 1,600 calories. I think that's a pretty good calorie deficit. Now to figure out maintenance, it, it, you know, you gotta experiment a little bit. You could go online, you know, and, 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 and look up how to calculate the basal metabolic rate and answer all these questions, like how active you are, how long do you sleep, you know, are you, you know, and kind of get a little bit of a better idea. But I think if you're, say you're 150 pounds, and you're in a calorie deficit 10 times your body weight, which is 1,500 calories. If you go up 500 to 750 calories, to me that's gonna be probably maintenance. So if you're 150 pounds, you're gonna lose weight eating about 1,500 calories, and then you're gonna be at kind of maintenance at around 2,000, 2,200, somewhere around there. But obviously it depends on how active you are and what you're doing, but that's a good general rule. But then it, it gets a little confusing for a guy like Gene who's kind of like a big, I'm sure he's a big, tall, like strong guy at 290 pounds. He may not want to go 10 times. I mean, I don't like to bring people too low because you want proper nutrition. You want your vitamins, your minerals, your nutrients. You go below 1200 calories, you're not, it's going to be really difficult. That's a general rule. So if you're really, if you're a bigger guy like 290, like 290 you know, you can probably go lower than 29 100 calories in a day for calorie restriction. He can probably go as low as maybe 25, still get an adequate amount of protein. And I would prioritize protein for sure. That's the key too, you know, without a doubt. Let's see what else we got here. Brian Greenback. Okay, Mike, what brand of protein powder would you recommend? Okay, there's three or four different brands that I like to use. I do like a whey protein isolate. And when I say isolate, isolate just means that um, it, everybody's like the fat stripped out of it. If you just buy like a whey protein, it'll have a casein, whey, you know, whey, it'll be a combination of just like milk proteins. You know, they can upset my stomach because I'm lactose intolerant. You can get away with it, but you're gonna get the fat. So if you wanna go with just like a, a whey protein, but it doesn't say isolate, or if it, a casein, which is more of like the slower digesting type dairy, then I will go grass fed, grass finished you may have to pay a little bit more because all the bad stuff is going to be in the fat. So you want to get, you know, you want that better quality fats from a grass-fed, grass-finished type cow. But all cows are, are, eat grass. It's just like that last like 20% of their life, if they're finished with grass, you'll have a better like fat profile for sure. And, and um, but if you're getting an isolate, you don't necessarily have to go grass-fed, grass-finished and buy a more inexpensive way because all the bad stuff is kind of stripped out of it. You're just left with the amino acids. I'm lactose intolerant. I can drink all the whey protein I want. doesn't bother me at all. But there are some good brands. I like, um, what's brand? I, I like Killer, Killer John's whey protein isolate. Look online. Actually, there's a gal there who's like a bodybuilding gal who looks incredible. She like sponsors it. That's one of the brands I like. But any of the good brands that say whey protein isolate. You know, Mark Sesson, he has a great whey protein. You know, Mark's Daily Apple, Primal, you know, Mark, Mark Sesson, you may have heard of him. He has a really good brand. But I would say anything grass-fed, grass-finished, even if you don't need it with an isolate, it'll probably be a better quality. The other type of proteins I take, I take a collagen protein almost every single day. Now that I'm doing this carnivore thing, I might not. I may or may not, but I don't know. If I do, I'll just mix it in water. I normally would mix it in like celery juice or something like that. I like collagen protein for the connective tissue. Like most of, 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 of your protein in your body is connective tissue. There's some, there's some pretty good research that says good for cartilage, good, good for your hair, good for your skin, good for your nails. No question about it. A couple of years ago, my nails were splitting all the time. I had no, I just said, what's going on? Why are my nails splitting? I'm getting old, I'm getting old man nails. I started taking between 20 to 30 grams of collagen protein within a month or two. The splits in my nails are gone. And yeah, I don't know if it's like a lot. I think, I, I, I think my hair grows faster, you know. Not that anything, I don't dye my hair. I'm f turning 59. Uh, is it the collagen protein helping? I'm like, who knows, you know. Um, I would fool around with a little collagen protein, especially women. It's supposed to be great for wrinkles. You know, I, I, I take collagen protein every single day. Back to Mark Sesson, he has a great brand of collagen protein. Vital Proteins, you know, the blue container, that's another brand of, of collagen protein that I buy. Great Lakes is another brand. I vary between those brands with the collagen protein, whatever, whatever seems to be on sale. 
that particular week. And the other protein I do buy, see, because collagen is an incomplete protein, doesn't have all the nine essential amino acids, is missing tryptophan. So sometimes I'll take collagen protein and I'll mix it. Maybe with whey, but it doesn't mix that great. I find if I mix it with that hemp seed. See, hemp seed protein is a complete protein, plus you're getting some fiber. So, so this is kind of like, this is a good question, because this is kind of like my pre-workout like workout drink when I'm doing resistance training. Like I may either do like um, celery juice, which is 35 calories, high in potassium. I think it's a great sports drink. It's a million times better than like a, a vitamin water or like a Gatorade, which is all sugar. It's 35 calories, you get like a thousand milligrams of potassium. And either I'll do a scoop or two of whey protein isolate like that, like that Killer John's whey protein isolate, which is a complete protein, or I'll do like a scoop of collagen protein, and then I'll also add a scoop of hemp seed to make it a complete protein, plus it gives me a little bit of fiber. So I do that all the time, and those are all the proteins I do all the time, because I do believe, if you know my general rule, 0 0.9 grams of protein per pound of lean body weight minimum. So if you're 150 pounds, once again, so I say you're 20% body fat, so you get 130 pounds of like lean mass, you know, with your organ, the connective tissue, all that, you want at least like 115 grams of protein minimum. I personally, now that I'm doing the carnivore, I'm crazy high, but I typically would eat maybe 130, 150 grams of protein on a regular basis when I'm eating my normal low carb, whole food, natural diet. Protein has the highest thermic effect Every 100 calories of protein you're eating, you're gonna burn up 20 to 30% just digesting and processing the protein is the building blocks. I think also key to long-term weight loss, plus the older you get, the more protein you need. Super important protein. And if you wanna read another great book, I, one of my favorite diet books from last year is Dr. Ten, Dr. Ted Needleman, The PE Diet. And he talks about how important protein is. I say my diet, I would probably say is the, my favorite diet is probably the closest to Ted Needleman's out of all these books that I read all the time. I really love, love his book, That PE Diet. And he's an illustrator, some cool illustrations in there too. Okay, let's see, we got Mad, Mad Bulldog. Hey Mike, do you take creatine while fasting? You know, I don't, I've taken creatine in the past and it's worked incredibly well for me. I mean, I've even done some videos on it. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, Mad Bulldog, creatine totally works. I don't do when I'm fasting because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not all that concerned about. I do want to be strong, obviously, and I want to be, be muscular. I find that I, I, it bloats my face. <laughs> Maybe I'm getting like you know vain now that I'm getting older, because you know this. I'm sure you know how creatine works. Okay, cre okay. I'll give you a quick like the science behind it quickly. Okay, all muscle contraction is fueled by ATP, and it's in triphosphate. And about five to seven seconds of muscle contraction, like, like say you're deadlifting something really heavy and you're gonna like hold your breath, whatever, the first three to five, five to seven seconds, you're gonna be using ATP to contract those muscles. So once you use up that ATP, those three phosphate molecules, you're left with ADP and this in diphosphate. And then you, the next energy phase is the creatine phosphate phase where creatine is actually stored in the muscle. So ADP grabs a creatine, a creatine phosphate to make ATP again. And that lasts for like, it's hard to say, around 30 seconds or so, okay? And you can get, and then your body makes creatine on its own, and then you can get creatine from your diet, like, you know, red meat, salmon is high in creatine. But if you take a creatine, like monohydrate, I, th I, th I think that's the one, right? The creatine, if you take a creatine supplement, you can store more creatine within the muscle. So for example, instead of only having 30 seconds of that ATP to creatine, you may have 35, 40 seconds. So like for example, if you can, if you can bench press say 200 pounds 10 times in 30 seconds, and now you take creatine, you may be able to bench you know, 200 pounds 12 times in like 36 seconds. It's incredible. And it also volumizes the muscle cell. Like the more, just like carbohydrates, when you store carbohydrate and glycogen in your muscle, there's like a three to four ratio of water for every gram of glycogen, you hold three to four grams of water, so it volumizes the muscle cell. Same thing with creatine. When you take creatine and it's stored in the muscle, it's gonna volumize the muscle cell too. And it's, but the thing is, you know, there's muscles in your face, is, but I find that I, I feel, even though I, I love how I feel, I feel strong on it, 
and I like to move a little extra weight. It is great for protein synthesis and all that. This is probably the most studied supplement and there's no question about it, it works. I feel like it's a little too puffy and a little too bloated from it. So I don't really, you know, may, I, I may try it again. I mean, I haven't tried it in a while, but um, I mean, it's probably a good strategy with fasting. I haven't read any studies on that though, on taking creatine in the past. I think, you know, I'm gonna Google that. It, it, maybe tonight I'm gonna look on that. That'd be a good video to make. Um, taking creatine while fasting. It'll be kind of interesting. I'm gonna look into that. That's a, that a quick, great question, Mad Bulldog, I appreciate it. Let's see what Gene's got here, okay. Do you think taking probiotic fiber supplements is worth it? You know, you could, I pro pre I mean, I, I, it's interesting, a, a good, good probiotic can be really expensive and the, the best ones come refrigerated. I mean, you, you can spend $150 a month. I just think what I personally do I'm not doing it this week because I'm doing this carnivore tier one thing. But I eat fermented foods every single day. A fermented food is like a, like a prebiotic, right? It's going to feed the good bacteria in your stomach. It's going to make those medium, the small chain fatty acid, the virus, you know. So I eat like um, sauerkraut almost every day. I eat pickles almost every day. I take apple cider vinegar almost every day, you know, from having a saddle balsamic vinegar too. And I drink enough, I'm drinking wine, I'm getting a little fermented food, if you have yogurt. See, fermented food supposedly, I just, and I wanna do a video about this, I just read this study a couple of weeks ago talking about, they compare straight up fiber, like just taking fiber, as opposed to eating fermented type foods. And they say like the biodiversity within your stomach was much greater, was much better from fermented foods as opposed to fiber. So I would eat fermented foods all the time. Like my daughter loves that kombucha drink, even though it could be a little sugary and could be high in sugar. Um, that's a good thing to drink, but I would definitely eat fermented foods like on a regular basis. I think that's the best thing you can do. But a prebiotic, I mean a probiotic, if you find a good one, there's so many, you know, there's so many probiotics in the body. Some of them, some of them are, are, are dead on the shelf, you know, like you're spending all this money and you're getting no benefit. You gotta, you gotta research it a, a little bit. Now, I used to know uh, some good brands. I don't, I can't recall them right now, but there's a time when I was taking them for a while. I had a friend of mine who had like really bad colitis and he, he contributes him curing himself from it. He buy this refrigerated brand of this probiotic. It was like 150 a month. I was taking it for a while and I stopped, but I may do it again. You know, it's good to fool around with this stuff. Okay, let's see what we got. Catch up, course. Thumbs up, Mike. Oh, thanks. I, I appreciate it. Oh, the cat looks great. Cool. Cool. Let's see what we got here, man, though. Oh, thanks for the answer, man. No, I appreciate the question. Great question. I love to Creatine, it, it is one of the supplements that totally does work. No question about it. Okay, let's see. Any, any other questions out there? So now we got, okay, I got past the hour. We got an hour and four minutes. I want to give you, a, all right, that, thanks for, uh, that's good. I want to give anyone a couple more minutes because it, it, sometimes it takes a minute or two before these questions come in before I see them. But I think we had a pretty good turnout today. I hope I didn't like overdo it with the subject. This is my last video on the pre, post workout, vacation type thing. I just wanted to finish it up. Plus, it's my first week really back at work, and you know, it takes me more time to make you know to make a video and edit. I really like doing these lives. Um, I really do like that. I like you know communicating with everyone. I love doing the lives. But I'm gonna do a couple of videos um, this week. I got one request to do a video for resistance training for women. And leaning towards the fact that like women don't necessarily want to get muscular, and I do have a little bit of approach like that. Even though women don't have obviously the hormones like men to get overly muscular, but I've trained you know I've been training women for 35, 40 years, and I've trained dozens and dozens of women who do not want to get one millimeter bigger. You know they got a, a certain size pair of jeans they want to fit in. If their legs get any bigger, they're not working out. So I I do have a, a whole theory on that on how I generally like to train women. To increase their strength, to increase their their muscle without necessarily over volumizing the muscle cell, and you know I, I'll, I'm going to do I think I'm going to do a video on that. But a, any other videos you, you you know you want me to make, let me know. Leave it in the comments. I love to know because sometimes it, it gets hard. I, I know I got I know everyone's interested in intermittent fasting. If you follow me, and I can probably do a video every single day on a different strategy, a different subject, a different study about intermittent fasting. But I want to I don't want to get known just for that. I want to kind of be you know, like the 40 and over guy who talks about fitness, health, you know, nutrition, weight loss, and exercise like in a good positive way. All right. All right, guys, I really appreciate everyone showing up. I, I appreciate your support. I really love doing these lives. And I, I'll, next time I'm going to give you a little more notice. Once again, I'm, I still can't pin down an exact time to go live every single week because training clients, my schedule just varies so much all the time. Like I, I I can't turn away the business if I have someone in my gym I have to train, so I, that's why I kind of only give him one a couple hour notice. I think Gene's got another question here. Let's see what we got, Gene. Okay. 
Do you take something like vitamin D? Do I take supplements, vitamin D or omega-3 or anything else? I'll, yeah, I'll tell you what I generally take. Well, obviously, like I spoke about earlier, I do take all those protein powders, right? I take the collagen, I'll take a whey protein isolate, I'll take a hemp seed protein powder, just to make sure I'm getting enough protein powder. I always take a multivitamin. Probably my two favorite brands, I take Thorn. Um, Thorn is a great brand, and I take the basic two, which is a real simple multivitamin. Thorn, whatever is third party tested, like whatever they say is on the bottle is in the bottle. It's probably one of the best brands. It's hard to find it in stores because they have this rule where there has to be like a licensed like nutritionist or someone with like a you know, a real professional before you know they can render, recommend the vitamins in a proper way. They just you won't see them as CVS or Walgreens. You got to go to like a real nutrition type person to get the Thorn vitamins. But you can get them online, and they also have great customer service. You can call them up. I've called them up numerous times. And you can ask them a ton of questions. Yeah, they're somewhat expensive. They also have incredible protein powders and they just magnesium, everything. Okay, so I, I take a multivitamin. The other one I'll take, I'll, sometimes I'll take Alive Plus 50 for men over 50. Another good multivitamin. I do take Omega-3. I take Carlson's. I do about a tablespoon almost every day of the Carlson's fish oil, you know, for the DHA and EPA. I, I try, you know, I try to... Make sure you get enough of that. Plus, I mean, tons of salmon and, and, and sardines and, and, you know, oily fish all the time. So I think my omega-3 ratio is really good. I don't need any seed oils. I, I don't cook with vegetable oil or corn oil. All my oils are extra virgin olive oil, a little bit of coconut oil, and a little bit of uh, grass-fed butter, that curry grass-fed butter. I do take magnesium citrate, you know, because I want to make sure I'm getting enough magnesium. Plus, my system, if anything leans a little bit towards constipation, not really, but slightly, and a little magnesium citrate, you know, sucks water, but pulls water into your colon. If you got a constipation issue, that's the first thing I would try, 400 milligrams of magnesium citrate. It'll probably just fix it right there, and it's a good thing to take anyway. You know, I fool around with all other things now, and sometimes I'll take turmeric, you know, maybe I'll take a little turmeric, maybe I'll take a little CoQ10, 100 milligrams. I, I cycle in and out of these things, and I also, same thing with the supplements. You know who I got this from? I don't know if you ever heard of Paul Check. Paul Check's like a guy, guy my age. He has like the Czech Institute. He's been training trainers and I've never met him. I'd love to meet him. He's kind of an interesting guy, kind of a philosopher. And I heard him say this like 10 years ago and that kind of stuck with me. Saying that, you know, there are, it's good to take supplements, but they were all, it's also good just like when you're taking a diet break or a workout break. There are times when you want to take nothing and you want your body to reach for these things. Meaning that if you're constantly supplementing all the time, you know, you can overwhelm your system to some degree. So I also like to take a break from taking vitamins. Plus, there is definitely some research that if, you, if you're working out, you know, like I said earlier, you're making a little bit of inflammation, you're creating a little bit of inflammation response as part of the optimal workout. You can overdo it, but say you do an optimal workout, it's probably not good to take like antioxidants or take a multivitamin right after your workout. And I generally don't. Maybe I'll take my multi, you know, I like to work out midday. Or maybe I'll take my multi with dinner. Um, you know, I may take my fish oil with lunch or well, obviously a protein powder, but I generally take my multis and my mag magnesium with dinner. But you may, I, I, I fool around with all different supplements, anything that gets hot. I don't like those, any type of the stimulant type things and I know some things don't work and I don't take that, but I, I think supplements are pretty good. Let's see what else we got here. Um, I do take any, and vitamin D, right? Okay, the vitamin D, I actually, if you see how tan I am, not that I, I mean, I love the sun. I walk out, I walk outside every single day. My vitamin D levels have always been incredible. So that's not an issue for me. And another general rule is interesting when it comes to sunlight too, because that's the best way to absorb vitamin D. If you're more of a dark or pygmy like me, I'm more Mediterranean and Italian, you need more sunlight to absorb vitamin D, right? So I don't burn myself. I think sunlight is good for you, you know, but if you're fair, if you're like, you know, blonde and blue eyed, you don't need that much sunlight. I mean, you can get 10 minutes of un unprotected sun every day and bet that could be more enough. Plus the multivitamin um, has a little bit of vitamin D as well. I think it has about six to 800. You know, people take 10,000, you know, a day if they're, if they're low on vitamin D. But I'm pretty good on vitamin D, but I do recommend vitamin D, especially if you don't get outside enough, especially in the winter, you know, for sure. Okay, let's see what we got here. Oh, thanks, Jane. I appreciate it. I'm glad you found that helpful. Cool. Let's see what Brian's got here. Brian Green. Mike, I've been enjoying listening to your podcast on Spotify. Oh, cool. You know, I, I got to get that going. I'll tell you, um, I, okay, Brian's listened to, I have, a, I have a, a podcast that called Fitness Contrarian. And I have to say, it's, no, it's not as active as I'd like it to be. It's maybe, I don't know, maybe they got about 10 
episodes on there and you know with my schedule like I own the gym right I'm up five in the morning training people all day I try to do two of these videos a week and I'm doing these live streams you know I feel like I'm running like a mini media company but I really want to do a podcast you know every single week so what I did a few times is that when I'm walking I wear a headphone and I plug it into my phone and I just talk and I record like a 30 or 45 minute podcast. Um, you know, I like it. I, I, I have to say though, I don't think the sound quality is as good as I like it to be. But the whole theory of this podcast is like the fitness contrarian. Like I wanted to pick topics that are somewhat contrarian to what the mainstream fitness media and fitness experts are saying. Because I did have a really, and I really, I really feel bad what happened about it. I had a really popular website about 10 years ago called the fitnesscontrarian.com and I would this is when blogging was really popular I was writing a blog post like every other day on a contrarian topic like I was talking about intermittent fasting 10 12 years ago on this blog I was getting like 2 3000 hits a day and then I, I you know I had some problems with the site there was a, I had a malware someone attacked the site I couldn't access it for a year and I had all these problems with the site and I wound up getting rid of it and I said, you know, instead of instead of redoing the website, and I still own the URL, Fitness Contrarian, I said, I'm going to start doing a Fitness Contrarian podcast. So I would love to get that going. Like I'm thinking about maybe even taking these live streams or doing something and maybe turning that, that, that into a video podcast or maybe really finding the time where I can sit in front of a mic like this and just, just record a really good podcast. Plus, I have so many friends. Yeah, and so many trainers that I've trained, like with, or, like I opened my first gym in 1989. I've trained so many younger people. Like and now they're all, they're older. There's tons of people I could interview. One of my best buddies, a chiropractor, I'd love to interview him. My best friend hired me in 1984, and we managed this gym together. He's still a trainer, super knowledgeable guy. I always try to talk him into like hosting the, a podcast with me, but he's so low profile. Like he, he's he's doing really well training people he, he he's he's a contrarian himself he he actually he's in iowa right now with that, that he goes to the iowa state fair he has wife's from iowa they're having a blast right now but I, w I would love to get the fitness contrarian podcast going but i appreciate you brand uh, brian um asking about that let's see compliment blade love the po oh you like the podcast too whoa thanks this is maybe i should get that podcast going i didn't realize i don't know how many downloads i have i only think i have about five six hundred downloads on that podcast but i would love to get that going okay i'm glad i'm going to get that podcast going i really appreciate this input this is great solid advice cool all right great i'm going to get the podcast going so that, that's that's my next goal that's going to be one of my my goals in starting september to try to put out one good podcast every single week so if there any particular topics you want me to do on the podcast let me know too all right, so this is great. I really appreciate it. It's interesting. A few more people jumped in the room, so I'm sure you guys, I can't see it because I'm here. I'm sure you guys gave me some thumbs up and maybe YouTube is starting to like, like put this um, live stream out to more people. So a whole bunch of people just jumped in. So any other questions from anyone? Fitness, health, nutrition, weight loss before I, before I roll? And then I say, I already, I already did a little hit, but I'm going to take, after these podcasts, I, I mean, after these live streams, I get a little worked up. So I'm going to go take like a 30 minute walk just to relax myself a little bit. Plus, the, I, the sun's supposed to come out in New York around around five o'clock, so it's perfect timing. All right, any other questions, guys, gals, about anything? All right, because so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna bolt, I'm gonna do my run, and once again, I really appreciate your support, everyone tuning in, I really appreciate it. Everyone have a wonderful night, and I'll try to announce the next live stream a little bit more in advance, okay? Well, take care, everyone, I really appreciate it. Take care.